So over the last few videos, we've been talking about the history of the development of evolutionary thought or the many different scientists from many different fields which actually contribute to the formation of our current understanding of evolution. And what we're going to try to do on this last video is actually try to get you in the mind of Darwin. What was he thinking when he set sail to this journey around the world and observed the patterns of diversity that actually planted a seed together with everything he knew about these things to actually formulate his theory of evolution. And it would actually take him many years to put it all together. And that's why one of the reasons he delayed the, the publication of his book, in addition to the fact that he knew he was going to enrich criticism and was kind of scared, and that he was actually had other interests to work that he was working on as well. But what was he thinking? Uh, what did he know at, about the world that actually made him come up with this theory of evolution? So certainly there are many areas that have contributed to the, to the evolutionary thought that uh, Darwin had of its time. And one of the most influential areas are going to be geology and paleontology, also ecology and economics, and then heredity, or that we now call genetics. Let's talk about some of these things. First of all, geology and paleontology. Um, what he knew from this by scientists like Liel and Hutton and Cuvier and many others that actually work on these things by his time is that one, the earth was very ancient. By, by Darwin's time, people used to think that the earth was millions of years old. Now we actually know it's much, much older. And you also have from gradualism the idea the earth is gradually changing. Remember that from James Hutton. We also know from Liel that it, these processes occur at uniform rates or uniform materialism, and you can actually use this to actually predict the way the earth changes. And he also knew that because of these changes, which are often sudden, like, for example, you see in the screen a big meteor strike or volcanic eruptions or things of the sort, species do not often survive these changes. And that, that's why so much change has happened in the Earth, so much change has happened in life. And this is one of the ideas that Darwin went with as he set sail to travel around the world and then formulate his theory of evolution. Another big thing that contributed to his mentality was ecology and economics especially as it applies to the idea of population dynamics or how populations respond to changes in the environment. So things that we know today and take it for granted, like food webs and food chains and things like that, were all being developed during his time. These ideas, these principles, were actually being studied by scientists that we call naturalists, specifically ecologists, which try to understand how animals connect them to each other and to the environment and how they depend on each other. So it's the study of interactions between animals and their environment. And much we had learned about that and about economics with scientists like Thomas Malthus and to actually come up with these things that he knew about it. Let's see what he knew. First of all, the idea of a species. Linnaean taxonomy had already been established by then and the, a lot of different scientists knew that a specific type of organism refers to species and that members of the species are members that can reproduce viably or in other words make fertile offspring uh, that can have other generations afterwards. And so that's the ecological species test, or the idea that each species is a group of organisms that can have uh, babies with each other, and those babies can have babies with each other and so forth. And so he knew about species. And in fact, he was actually a leading scientist in researching species and classifying different species of animals and plants. And also the idea of population was very well established, or that that was basically a group of animals of the same species. And that would be important for his theory because he would talk about the fact that a single specimen could not evolve, but that a species evolved as a population. So when he meant the origin of species, he meant the changes within the population. Uh, important for that concept is the idea also of population size, which is the total number of organisms of a species which are living in a certain, a certain area. For example, right now the population size of humans in the world is narrowing 8 billion people. And soon enough, we will hit more, much, much more than that. Predictions, in fact, say that we'll get close to 10 billion very soon. And that, that may just very well be the carrying capacity for life on Earth. And you actually see how interesting how a population, human population, has exploded uh, over the last hundreds of years. And that for millions of years, the population has been pretty much stable, growing steadily and slowly over time, as we have to face limiting factors, including sickness, disease, predation, and limiting resources. But as the Industrial Revolution and modern medicine and sanitation hit, 
explosion of human population has actually happened. And modern agriculture and a green revolution made that even worse after the 1670s. And the population has shot from 3 million to almost 8 billion in a course of less than 30 years. And you see how this actually created a massive amount of increase in the population of the earth. Now, this is just an example of we talk about population size. And also, you see here an example of population density, which is the average number of organisms per unit area. Look how, for example, in the U.S., the majority of the population is still living along the east coast of the U.S., with some exceptions around California and the west coast states. But the middle of the U.S., in the deserts and all the green areas of the U.S., it's actually very, very, very sparsely populated compared to the east coast and extreme west coast. And so that's the idea of population density, of how many people live in a certain area. Uh, these were things which were already discussed during his time, and it was important because it's going to be a, make a, a basis of his idea that populations are going to struggle when they're too large or too dense. And so we're going to talk about that. Uh, now, the reasons why populations struggle is because they change. Their numbers increase over time, and, and the population density will get higher or lower. And to understand why that happens, there's two things that can cause populations to go down. You either emigration, which is as animals leaving a certain area, or death, okay? And population will increase by immigration, which is new populations reaching a certain area, or by birth rate. So whenever the immigration plus birth rate is, is bigger than the death rate plus immigration, you're going to have population growth. For example, in this graph here, you see population growth because the birth rate is bigger than the death rate. But of course, you would also have to consider whether or not animals are leaving the area. Or in other words, if the immigration rate is bigger than the emigration rate and so forth. Or vice versa. Now, now when you're talking about population growth, you can actually look at things like this, which we call population graphs. And you see that a population like this, which has a lot more younger people than older people, is growing. And this is typically common in uh, third world countries where the sanitation and other things are not and education is not that advanced and then people are not taking care of trying to uh, curb the number of children that they have which is part of the reason why why they actually have social problems there's too many people and slow growth uh, where it's going to happen where there's just about as much old people as uh, as young people but if there's more old people than young people and it's an upside down pyramid then you have negative growth and that's what happens in some first world countries where the population is actually shrinking and as populations grow from this, we call it a demographic transition, which is the process of changing the population over time as, a, a, as, as the population become more common. And this is a little bit of a review that we talked about when we did ecology. Now remember, there's actually three types of population in terms of growth. Uh, you're going to have linear growth when, po when populations increase a little bit over uh, and, and a specific flat rate. But this is very rare in life forms. In fact, uh, life forms will either grow exponentially or logistically. Now, populations will tend to grow exponentially when um, there is unlimited resources. And this is a pattern of growth marked by multiplication of offspring by a certain factor with each generation instead of addition of, of the same number of offspring with each generation as it would be with linear growth. And this is going to happen if there's unlimited resources. And this is something that Malthus was talked about. And Darwin had that in his mind at the time that he was actually working on evolution. But populations actually in natural environments tend to grow for what we call logistic growth. And they struggle to grow at first as they cope with the new environments. But then they finally start growing very, very fast until the point where they actually the resources become scarce. And the population numbers start to grow slightly less fast until they actually flatten out as they reach the elusive, what we call carrying capacity, or the total number of organisms that can be supported by a certain habitat based on the number of nutrients or resources that that habitat has. If the population actually exceeds the carrying capacity, what's going to happen? You're going to have a crash of the population because you have too many people uh, for the resource that the environment can actually support. And there's actually two types of population. One is called R-selected species, and the other one is called K-selected species. And now we actually don't use this much more because we know that there's actually a continuum here. that species falling between the two strategies. But some species go for quality. They have less babies. They have longer maturation periods. They take care of their young. And they go for quality. It's because they're trying to deal with the carrying capacity. So they try to... Uh, Make, maximize the quality of their life and their offspring to make sure that they will survive. So they will have less babies, take care of their babies, take longer to grow up and maturate to the point of being having children. 
other species grow very fast, have very short lifespans, have thousands of children, don't take care of their young, multiply many, many times throughout their lifetime, and try to explode their populations. But then they quickly hit the carrying capacity and tend to crash afterwards. Case selected species tend to do well on where the environment has um, a certain stable number of resources, but if the resources are being depleted, our selection actually tends to survive more often because they're actually more resistant to evolution because they have that fast uh, growing rate rather than the case selection actually takes place. But these are, again, some reveal of what we talked about in terms of ecology. And these are some concepts that were developing during the time that he was actually talking about these things. Now, one thing that's very important, and that's definitely what Maldus had said, is that populations tend to grow exponentially if they could. As long as the birth rates plus immigration rates is bigger than the death rate plus emigration rate and the resources are available, populations will tend to grow exponentially. However, populations depend on the environment for survival. And so if whenever there's a surplus uh, of, of, of support, the people will actually allow themselves to grow more. But as the surplus decreased by things like starvation, disease, parasites, accidents, weather, hunting, predators, the carrying capacity is, is lowered and the populations will not be able to be supported as much as before, and you're actually going to have a, a crash in the population numbers. And this actually happens with seasonally, sometimes in natural environments. That means the populations depend on the environment. They depend on the nutrients, which are things that they require to survive. Things like water, energy, food, shelter. And they also depend on resources, which are things that they assist in their survival, such as uh, mates, shelter, and other things like that. And they also depend on a specific habitat or the actual location or the ecosystem where they actually live. And if the habitat changes, it becomes a problem. And they're also there as the concept of niche, which every species has a specific role or place within the environment where they actually live and do. And if you change this niche or if you change the habitat or if you deplete the resources of nutrients, uh, you're going to have a problem that's going to decrease the ability of animals to actually uh, support their environment. Numbers. And when population is growing, therefore, it is going to be limited by these things like the habitat, the accidents, the pollution, starvation, predation, resources, old age, hunting, and many other things. But these factors that limit the growth are categorized in two different categories. The first one are called density-dependent factors, which include competition, predation, disease, and parasitism. And these are things that, that depend on the numbers of organisms which are in the population. Competition for food, resources, mate, shelter, water, energy, and niche is going to be one of the driving things lowering the population numbers. And it obviously depends on how many people are around. So that's why we call it density dependent. Likewise, predation depends on how many people are around. Because that's basically organisms eating others for energy. Predators are, have an easier time spotting large populations. But members of a large population, which herd, have a greater chance of survival because it's less likely for any one given member to be the one eaten. And uh, other, other animals, which are not pack animals, rely more on actually running or hiding in order to survive rather than on numbers. But either way, numbers or density definitely affects predation. And the number of predators may also depend on this. Some predators live together and depend on each other and they actually hunt as a pack, while other predators tend to hunt by themselves. So you see, depending on which strategy you have, you're going to hunt, you're going to group or not group. But clearly, predation also depends on the number of population. And remember that predators and prey actually depend on each other. And if the predator numbers increase, the prey numbers will, will decrease, creating what we call the predator prey relationship, where Throughout time, as the number of prey increases, the number of prey decreases, and as the number of prey decreases, uh, the number of predators increases and so forth. So you create this up and down motion that we call a predator and prey relationship in the environment. So it, clearly, predation depends on numbers. Also depending on numbers is the idea of disease. It is easier to succumb to disease and sickness if the population size is bigger, or it spreads faster if people are close together or are allowed to talk to each other. And that's why in modern societies, diseases will spread very, very fast because we have a global society where travel happens around the world. You also have density independent factors, such as catastrophes or natural disasters that large, kill large quantities of, of members. Whether there are large or small populations, they will kill them the same way. Though the large populations have a greater chance of having a survivor, uh, members will be killed indiscriminately during a natural disaster. And that includes things like habitat destruction, 
or loss of large numbers of resources that kill large populations and small populations alike. Uh, so all of these concepts of ecology were in uh, the mind of, of Darwin during its time, and, and also in the scientists of today as we try to understand evolution. And if not all the details we talked about, certainly the idea that populations depend on the environment and that limited resources will limit it, the chances of a population to actually survive.